over the last 20 years I've been studying a variety of things, but perhaps the, the most, uh, most passionate side of my research from my perspective is studying great white sharks, or white sharks as we call them here in Australia. Tell me a little bit about the white sharks. White sharks are, are an iconic species in both Australia and around the world. Uh, they're one of the, the first shark species to be protected in various parts of the, uh, the world, but here in Australia they were protected in about 1996. But what we didn't know about them was that they're just not a coastal species that you occasionally see around seal colonies. That was the norm back in the days when I was first studying white sharks. What our research and others around the world have discovered is that the world really is their oyster and they move incredibly wide distances, not just in coastal seas. And it's not just move, movements of, of adults and sub-adults that we're talking about. We're finding juveniles and adults and sub-adults moving around broad areas of Australia and across ocean basins to other areas of the world. All right. Uh, are they, when, when they move those big distances, are they wandering aimlessly or are they behaving like they know where they're going? Or? One of the intriguing parts about looking at the movement patterns of top order predators like white sharks is that we're starting to see a pattern where their movements are not random. They appear to know where they're going. And there appear to be key places in our, our seas around Australia and in seas uh, elsewhere around the world in coastal areas but also offshore areas where white sharks spend their time. So they're not distributed ran randomly and they're not distributed evenly. There are key hotspots, key critical habitats that they seem to hang out in and then they move between those areas relatively directly and relatively quickly. All right. You mentioned that they were one of the first species to get protection in some parts of the world. What, do, what does an animal that large need protection from? White sharks, like many shark species, will are under the threat from a, a variety of different uh, fishing techniques and habitat disruptions. But again, sharks and rays around the world, by and large, many of their populations, many of these species, are very poorly adapted to, to having their numbers withdrawn from the ocean. They don't reproduce largely until they're very big, they don't reproduce very often, and when they do reproduce, they don't reproduce very many young. Now that makes them very susceptible to having their populations decline due to non-natural mortality, ways of dying in, in other ways other than just growing old. But it, white sharks, or sorry, sharks in general, come in all different shapes and sizes. Some are more productive than others. Some are more, uh, are more uh, resilient to fishing pressure than others. But some of these bigger species like white sharks that take a, a long time to mature and don't produce very many young, they're the ones that are really susceptible to incidental captures. All right. And the, the different life history stages of these sharks, you mentioned adults and sub-adults and juveniles. Do they travel together or do they make the same kind of movement patterns or do they go to the same places? Or? Understanding movement patterns in a species like a white shark is key to understanding their, uh, their populations, the connectivity between different areas and the key habitats that we might look at to help uh, protect a species like this. Now, What's interesting about their movement patterns is even the juveniles that we've worked with, even two metre white sharks that are perhaps only one or two years old, are still moving broad distances, thousands of kilometres along our, our coastal uh, fringe, as well as going out into the open ocean and diving to a thousand metres. Now we don't have any evidence of white sharks travelling together as a coordinated group, but we have clear evidence that there are certain key places key times where you get aggregations of different white sharks. Now how they, how they behave with each other in those aggregations, because they're the sort of areas that, that really give them the opportunity for some sort of social behaviour. How that manifests itself though is still a subject of ongoing research. Did you say that they dive to a thousand metres? These are animals that are often seen at the surface too? They're not deep water sharks like the Greenland shark that we heard about? White sharks occur from our coastal fringe in water around about a metre deep or less, right out across open ocean depths. But what we haven't realised until the advent of electronic tags where we can track sharks when we're not with them anymore, where they can just go off and wear the instruments that we give them, and we either get those instruments back or those instruments transmit the data back to us. What this has opened up is a much broader understanding of the areas where species like white sharks go and how they behave in these areas. Now what we didn't realise 
when we only saw white sharks around our coastal fringe. Because indeed, the open ocean is a significantly important habitat to them. And when they're in the open ocean, it's not only travelling throughout the open ocean or finding places in the open ocean near the surface that they, they like to hang out in. These animals are diving to depths of over a thousand metres. Now, why they're doing that is still a mystery. In some cases, in some slightly shallower uh, dives uh, than to a thousand metres, it appears that they're following what we call the deep scattering layer in the sea. And the deep scattering layer is a, is a layer of, of animals that live down uh, deep during the daytime uh, and then come up to the surface at night. Squid, midwater fishes, and all the predators that feed on those things. It appears that in some cases, white sharks are targeting that level and that layer. But they're diving deeper than that for short periods, bounce dives to over 1,100 metres. We don't know why they do that. All right. How do you protect a species that has so broad a range? Protecting a species, whether it be in Australia or worldwide, when they have such global roaming capabilities is a really significant challenge. But what we're finding out more and more is although these species are widely ranging, it comes back to that there are limited areas, and in some cases with respect to juveniles in particular, highly restricted areas that appear to be key areas that are critically important to them. So part of our management strategy and part of our conservation strategy and our understanding is to find those areas and see how we can manage the, the impacts on the species in those areas, on, 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 white, on impacts on white sharks in those areas, but also perhaps use that information to help minimise the risks that these animals on occasions pose to us. All right. How did you get interested in studying white sharks? Uh, <laughs> I've had the luxury of working charts for a very long period of time now, but that's because it takes a long time to build up a picture of, of how they behave and what they do. How I got into that was actually through the oceanarium industry. When I first got a job at an oceanarium and became interested in sharks, and then through meeting a very close friend and colleague and who became my mentor in the shark world, um, my colleague said to me when I was going off to South Australia to, uh, to work over there, he said, Barry, we don't know a lot about white sharks. Uh, South Australia is a place where we get a lot. If you get the opportunity, start doing some research on it. And it went from there. Wonderful. Is there anything else you'd like to say about your research or about white, shark, white sharks? Or uh, what, what's next to be studied? What's the next big breakthrough in, mm -hmm. in white shark <clears throat> science? There are many things that we still need to understand and still need to find out about white sharks. We're starting to cross the bridge in understanding where they go, when they go there, and start to even understand why these places might be important. But we won't fulfill the why these places are important until we really understand what these animals are doing there. And it has to be more than just knowing that they're swimming up and down. We have to know how they're behaving in terms of what those behavioural signatures mean. Are they feeding? Are they resting? Where are they mating? Where are they giving birth? Understanding why they're in certain areas will really be the key next step for us to understand their populations and how we can appropriately conserve them.